Good evening, YouTube and podcast. Hopefully y'all can hear me. I think it, it sounds a little weird in my headset, so hold on just a second. Okay, it looks like y'all can hear me. Welcome to the Common Grounds Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Greenfield from Roasters Marketplace, and tonight we've got a very special guest. We're going to be interviewing Steph from Coffee by Steph, which is an amazing small batch coffee roaster and cafe located in Grayling, Michigan. We're really excited. I've been talking to Steph for a little while uh, in the green room about different things. She's going to give, hopefully give us a tour of, of her shop and the art gallery and the brewery and everything that they've got going on in her location. Really, really great coffee, really cool concept she's got going on. This is the actually the first time I've been able to sit down and talk to Steph without having to be outside doing yard work. We've been bouncing around. I talked to her pre-COVID. I think COVID had just started the first time I talked to her. And we've been through this kind of working together, getting her up on our website on roastersmarketplace.com uh, to, to share her coffee with everybody. But tonight she's going to share her story about her cafe, about her roastery, and about her little piece of the puzzle that she's got going on there in Grayling, Michigan. So if it's your first time watching us on YouTube or listening to the podcast, make sure you subscribe, give us a like, give us a follow. If you're watching out there right now, go ahead and hop onto YouTube, give us a comment, let us know where you're watching from. Thanks for joining us. And oh, by the way, next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time, we're having a special Veterans Day episode. What I'm doing is I'm getting all the small batch coffee roasters that I know that are veterans on the show, and we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about our time in service, where we've been, and what we think about coffee. It's going to be a really good show. I'll, I'll do a reminder later on. But thanks for tuning in, and let's roll with a little Dom Coors. Good evening, Stephanie. How are you? Hi. Doing? Very good. Thanks, Chris. Or Steph, I've already messed it up. Here we go. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I get tuned into the music and I get I want to listen to more of the song and then we we jump on uh, and roll it live. So how how's everything going tonight? It's going really well. We've had really beautiful weather the past couple of days, so I've been out trying to enjoy it as much as I can when I get out of the coffee shop and I uh, definitely have seen more people coming through northern Michigan looking to enjoy it themselves. So where is Grayling in relation to something that like somebody like me from Texas can orientate to in Michigan? Right. So in Michigan, we do everything by, you know, we call it the mitten where we point to everything. And I'm literally in the middle um, and it's on its way up to where the upper peninsula is. So in order for everybody who lives in these Through Grayling, so it's actually, I think they call it the gateway to the north. Awesome. I'm having a little bit of audio difficulty, so I'm going to switch okay. over to a different headset. This is why we have backups, people. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for everybody there. Can you still hear me? I can hear you just fine. Looks like we're going to have to do some editing on this one, too. Just give me one second. Sure. All right, now I got you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Awesome. I'm still working it. No problem. My headset was turned way up. So here we go. <laughs> there we go. Donnie's in the house. We've already got some people viewing, commenting. So, last I heard, you were, you're right in the middle of the state. So everybody right. down south 
customers. Coming up north goes through, we have a major highway that runs through the middle of the state called 75, and we are right off of that highway as people are getting up into more of the like rural areas. Um, and it is mostly a rural town. We're very seasonal. Um, like, uh, for example, on my street, I have a neighbor next to me that's there year round like we are, but the rest of the houses on my street are people who it's their second homes. They come up and do snowmobile trips or they come up to go hunting. And um, so it, there's a lot of fluctuation in who's here. And I, I do have regular people who live here that come into my coffee shop, but another big portion of the clientele that I have are people that are driving to somewhere. They may be driving up here, but most of the time they're going somewhere else and they get off the highway to get coffee from me on their way to wherever they're going. Nice. What's, yeah. what's, your, what's your local population look like? Uh, you know, I don't know that exact number, but I would estimate we're probably somewhere a little over 2,000 people. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, back in the day when I was growing up, that would have been a large town, but now <laughs> me, that's that's like a neighborhood down here where we're at. We're, you know, we're, we're just north of Houston, and I liken it. A lot of times you can, you can tell people, you know, we're an hour from Houston, but you're also an hour away from anywhere else, and we're still considered Houston. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's San Antonio the, is the same way. <laughs> yeah, it's the size of Connecticut. Like you can put Connecticut inside of Houston and still have room left. It's it's absolutely crazy. That's <laughs> so. How many regular customers do you think you have? Um, you know, I've never even tried to estimate in terms of regulars that come in how many of them there are. There's a huge number. In fact, it, I astonish myself sometimes because I try to remember everybody's name and what their favorite drink is. <laughs> And sometimes I do better on remembering their drink than I do the name, <laughs> but um, there are definitely a lot of familiar faces. And then again, like I said, some of them, I, I may never see them again. They got off the highway and they looked up where coffee was or they were coming up the highway and looked and got off to come in here. You should just start calling people by their drink names. <laughs> that could be your, that could, you know, good morning, latte. Good, good, good morning, so you latte. That'd be awesome. That's, so how'd you get, how'd you... What did you do before coffee and how did you get into specialty coffee in a cafe? Um, so it was actually a really long journey from when I first got into coffee versus actually doing it for a living. Um, my career prior to being in specialty coffee um, was with animals. I was a veterinary technician um, and I also worked at various horse farms and did a lot of work with horses. Um, which was my dream job. And I'm really happy that I got to do it for as long as I got to do it. I always knew that that was a very physical job. And at some point, as I got older, it was going to become too difficult to do it. So I'm actually really happy that I got to do it for the period of time that I did. Um, and then I, I did have a riding accident in 2015. That uh, is what made me need to switch careers um, because I was no longer able to be up on a horse for eight to 10 hours a day. Um, it's a long so that, time to be on a horse. Yeah, it is a long time to be on a horse. It was a lot of fun, but it's definitely a hard physical job. I think there's a lot more to it than people realize when they think, oh, you, you work with animals for a living. That's so much fun. It is, but it's also a lot of hard labor. <laughs> um, but I was very happy to come back around because I did have a very strong, intense love of coffee earlier in my life. Um, when I was in college the first time, I, I was actually studying theology and I was taking ethics classes. And one of my ethics teachers um, thought I might be interested in doing a backpacking trip where they were um, specifically looking at labor conditions um, in Central America. And so we, we went down, we went through Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama, and spent time at coffee farms and uh, banana plantations and observing what life was like for them there. And this was in, um, it would have been 97 to 98, um, which was quite a while ago, but it was an eye-opening experience for me. It was my first time out of the country, and it was also my first time really thinking about where the products that we get at the grocery store come from. Um, and I had not, I had had coffee, but it wasn't like I was really a fan of coffee prior to going down there and learning what they were doing and getting this appreciation um, of this drink that I didn't really think much of prior to it. Um, so it was, it was a very eye-opening experience to see what life was like for 
these coffee farmers and the impact that we as a large consuming nation have on it. And then also the influence that we as a consumer can turn around and have on it in both a negative or a positive way, depending on how we use it. So go ahead. So, oh, I was sorry. I interrupted you there. The, it's so amazing when I got into this specialty coffee and started doing research and, and looking at everything, I was blown away by some of the videos I saw of, you know, men and and women too with these baskets of fertilizer on their back marching up a, yeah. a hillside like this to just put fertilizer out on these plants because there was no other way that that fertilizer was going to get up there that, I mean, yeah. they, they didn't have a tractor that was going to go up the hill they didn't have any sort of system to mechanically move that fertilizer up and they were just packing, you know, you know, 60, 80, 100 pounds at a time up the hill on their back. It yeah. It's insane for, for coffee, something that most Americans take totally for granted. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you on that. And like I said, it had been something that, um, like I said, I, I don't, prior to that, I wouldn't say that I was like a coffee fan, really. I mean, I drank coffee if it was offered to me, but I, I also wasn't, I hadn't been introduced to real quality coffee either. Most places where you get that, you're getting grocery store coffee that, you know, you don't know how long that's been there. And it's usually some um, overly processed roast. <laughs> so um, I didn't necessarily have extremely fond associations with coffee, but um, it was an eye-opening experience. And then I also started to, because um, I did visit a couple of uh, farms where they also did their own roasting. And so I got introduced to that whole process. And I think that was the first time that someone talked to me about profiles in a cup and realizing ju that coffee is not just coffee, that there's all these different varieties and different flavors that you can experience. Um, uh, and I remember for the first time, instead of just grabbing a bag of coffee, one of the places I went that they had, they had roasted, we tasted many of their coffees and I selected the one I liked the most and brought it home with me. So that was also eye opening. Do you remember what that was? It was a Costa Rican and it was a medium dark roast, but I could not recall for you anything beyond that. There was a lot of coffee farms that I went to down there. But that's a good, a good recall of something that was totally new to you yeah. 20, 22 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you, did you, did your love of coffee stay with you or did it grow or, or how did that foster over the years that you were? It absolutely did. I, I came back and from that point forward, um, I started, you know, looking at the coffee aisle extremely differently. I started looking for coffee houses. I started paying attention to roasters. Um, I became a little more picky about what coffee I got because I realized, oh, I could really like this instead of just being okay with it. <laughs> um, and it was also something that was a bonding point between me and my dad. And I think that's the side of coffee that I really love is that there's a community and fondness and memories that are so strongly associated with taste and the various brain cells that we have up there. And so like, I remember that being something me and my dad had in common when I was in college, that he was very much a coffee drinker. And as I was finding these things, I could come back and share that with him. And so I have a lot of fond memories of sitting out on the, the front porch and having coffee and conversation. And it definitely at that point became a daily part of my life. Awesome. And um, go ahead. Uh, what's your favorite brew method? I definitely prefer pour overs, I think, to any other one. And that's, um, I mean, I definitely like the taste of them, but I also love the ritual of making it, the simplicity of it and sitting there and being able to watch it. And, it's, you know, when it's, when it's your first cup of coffee in the morning, it's like a wake up process <laughs> to do your pour over. Um, other times I find it just relaxing to sit there and to put my intention into that cup of coffee rather than just boiling up or heating up some water and walking away from mm -hmm. it. I, I, lo I love the process and I've been, I've been doing, starting to pull shots in the morning now, first thing. And that is a little bit more intensive than, yeah. uh, of, of a process. So it's, I, I wait till I wake up a little bit before I do that. <laughs> so so sure. tell me how you transitioned from in, from, from what you were doing into roasting and a cafe space. Sure. So 
when I, when I had the horse ac accident, I actually was living in California, um, which is where I met my uh, boyfriend. And uh, it's, as most people know, extremely expensive to live out there. And as I was facing this complete and utter change in careers, we felt that it was probably going to be a lot easier for us to not be living somewhere that was had such a high cost of living because I was living in Napa at the time, okay, which is yeah. a very nice area. Um, so we made the decision to move back here to Michigan because that's where he's from. And it's uh, we're close enough that we can visit his family, his grandparents, his uh, parents live in Port Huron, which is downstate, but it's close enough we can drive. Um, and the cost of living was just much more reasonable here. So I had actually never been to Michigan. I had never been anywhere that it snowed. <laughs> so <laughs> this was a big jump for me, but we, um, we moved here. And the very first day that I was here, I very much had this like Bay Area lifestyle of having a coffee shop that you regularly use. Um, and I'm sure it's like that in a lot of metro areas, but when you, when you live in places like the San Francisco Bay Area, everybody lives in pretty tiny spaces. And so since you have such a tiny space, you have a coffee shop that is where you meet your friends. It's where you do your business meetings. It's, it's where you stop on your way to or from work. It's just kind of a, like your living room since you don't really have one. <laughs> so um, that was just my lifestyle was to find a coffee shop that was gonna be my coffee shop. And I didn't find that when I got here. Um, instead, I found uh, the brewery that I'm next door to, and uh, I ended up applying for a job with them just to have some income coming in. And so I started working as their wine bartender because coming from Napa, I had a little more experience with wine than most of the people that were working as servers for them. So I got started there. And then it turned out after working for them for a little while, getting to know the owners of the brewery, um, they actually had a coffee roaster back with their brewing equipment and it wasn't being used. And I was like, so what's going on with this? <laughs> and um, as we got talking, I, I ended up talking to Brewer into showing me how to use his roaster. And um, as he was doing that, I was like, I, you know, I don't really know a lot about coffee roasting, but I'm pretty sure there's more to it than this. <laughs> so, um, I ordered some green coffee and got started playing with it. And um, they went from being a brewery that had a few coffee options you could pick up to we decided to full on add in a coffee shop. And this was actually at a different location than we're currently in because um, they did have two locations as a brewery. And then now with all of the stuff that's been going on with COVID, it's just one location. Um, but I moved my coffee shop right next door to them. So we're still closely linked and connected, um, although we're separate businesses. So, but that's kind of how I got into it. So tell us, tell the listeners about the space that you're in right now. So I am in a rather large, almost warehouse type space that is an art gallery and then my coffee shop. And then it goes into a microbrewery. Um, so... There's all different kinds of atmospheres here, depending on what type time of day you come in. Um, I very much have it set up as a coffee shop vibe in the mornings. Um, the art gallery has a phenomenal spread of different artists um, that are really pretty amazing. That was one of the first things I noticed when I moved to Grayling was this gallery as I walked through. Um, coming from the Bay Area, I didn't expect to see this level of art in a, a small town in northern Michigan. And um, I found it just to be a little gem that reminded me of the culture of being back in the Bay Area. So I, I really enjoyed coming in and visiting it. Uh, and then the brewery was the same way. It had a really fun atmosphere that was nice to hang out in and didn't seem as small town as uh, the surrounding area did. <laughs> um, but there's a lot for people to do in here. I mean, any time of day there's, uh, various activities going on. There's lunch, uh, cause the, the brewery is also a restaurant. Um, and we all work really well together. There's a lot of people that come in and they're there for the brewery. They stopped to experience that, but, um, with COVID and limited seating capacities right now, there's generally a wait time for people. So the coffee is something that they can do while they're waiting for a table. Um, and then that also draws them into the art gallery where they get to experience everything there is to offer in there. So what's, what's the brewery's name? 
it's paddle hard brewing paddle heart mm, paddle hard paddle hard yep we are um grayling is on the asabo river and we are famous for being the start of the asabo uh canoe marathon which is a people come from all over the world to do it they start here and then they paddle all the way over to uh, skoda um, which is the eastern side of the state and so it's a huge event for us here um, but most of the things in this town are themed around the canoe marathon that's 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 an interesting yeah <laughs> event. that sounds like fun though I, I might have to come up to the for the you should definitely come experience marathon. it it's um it's quite the thing and it blows me away these guys they paddle straight through and it starts at night. It starts at nine o'clock at night. So a big portion of this race is going down this river as fast as they can in the dark. In the dark. That's <laughs> I'm good. I think I'll, I'll think I'll, I'll think I'll spectate. I don't think I'll participate yeah. in that one. And we've got one of your fans uh, says, Cheryl Cook says, love Stephanie's coffee. That's my sister, and she is definitely a faithful drinker of my coffee. I send it to them every month. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. She's That'd actually awesome. in Seguin, Texas, so she's right down in your neighborhood. Yeah, she's just a, uh, just a few hours away from me over yeah. there in San Antonio area. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for tuning in, Cheryl. I really appreciate it. I really enjoy having people's comments and questions and uh, interaction with our, our space. So when you... When you transition to the coffee roaster and the mm -hmm. brewer was showing you how to roast coffee, where did you seek out more information on roasting coffee at that point when you realized that there was more to it than what he was doing? Right. Um, that was actually a big challenge. I, I started by asking, at, obviously at that point in time, we were buying coffee from someone else because we weren't roasting our own. And um, I started by going to them and saying, hey, can I get green coffee from you? And do you offer any sort of like, I'll pay you to teach me how to roast? Do you have any internships? Do you have anything? And honestly, they were pretty funny about it. Um, mm -hmm. They saw that as me going into competition with them. And so they, would, they didn't give me much information at all. Um, I did order a little bit of their green coffee, which they were willing to give me, um, I think it was like two pounds. Um, and I did experiment with that, but I, I also figured that wasn't really going to go anywhere. So then I started to, to do a little more reaching out and trying to get more information and started realizing that there was, um, it's not as easy to access as I had thought that it would be. Um, there's a few good books out there. Um, the Coffee Roasters Companion by Scott Rao is definitely one I recommend to anybody that's getting into roasting. Take a look at because the science behind it is really a tool that will help you be able to make the coffee what you want it to be as opposed to just experimenting and trying to find something. So I definitely recommend books like that. And there are a few books out there. Um, the other thing that I would say um, was my one of my big eye-opening moments, I went to um, New York for Coffee Fest and I attended several workshops that were specifically on coffee roasting. And while those were brief, I was introduced to a lot of concepts that I was then able to come home and do more specific research on. And I think that's where I really started to develop. Um, but a lot of what I have learned has been from roasting communities from like being on Facebook and roasting groups, other fluid bed roasters, reaching out and talking to people about what they're doing, answering questions for people. Cause sometimes I think we don't realize um, how much we learn from ourselves when somebody asks a question and you're like, Oh, well I'm doing this. And then you, you learn a lot about your process and answering their question. One of the best ways to learn a skill or a task or get better at something is to teach somebody else. 100%. 100% agree with you on that. That is, It is just so interesting to get out and find out more information and then share it. And, you know, we've had the conversations about website stuff and Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. And, and the more I talk about it, the more I, I help other people with it. It's, it's the more I learn. And I was like, okay, that's a good question. Let me go find out. And that's your roaster behind you right? yes it is yes can it you, is let's see if you can give it give us a quick tour of your space sure yes. see if i can do this without shaking everything around too much mm -hmm. oh, okay 
Let's see there. Okay, so this is my Artisan 6M fluid bed roaster. Um, it has a maximum capacity of six pounds, but I usually do more around the range of three to four pounds because I find I get more consistency in the beans throughout the roast if I do a smaller batch than the six pounds. So I've occasionally done six pounds and it wasn't bad, but it wasn't my best either. So I right. try to keep it in that range. Um, and then, so this is the urn. Um, which obviously you know how fluid bed works. The air comes up through there and circulates the beans and then it goes into this vent here. Um, and then it goes through a filter that takes out the, the uh, chaff that comes off of the coffee and then it obviously gets vented out the ceiling. And then this is my cooling tray, which I can open up and run cool air through and I uh, use this little spoon here to stir it around so that I can stop the roast as quickly as possible. Um, once I've done that. And then there's the workstation for the coffee back behind me here. Okay. Um, and it's a pretty small area. Um, I would say, I don't know how much you can tell from in here what the size is, but it's about the size of a food truck, um, which I actually really like. The previous location was very large and it made it difficult to get around quickly and get things done efficiently, even though it was a nice, beautiful layout. Um, this one being smaller makes uh, making the coffee and getting it out faster much more efficiently. And what, what sort of espresso machine do you have down there? That is a Ranchilio Epoca 2 group. Awesome. And then I have a Mazer Super Jolly um, grinder right there next to that. I'm going to walk a little bit further in here. Yeah. You'll have to excuse. I've got my retail products back in here because right now the coffee shop's closed and the bar is still open. So I move <laughs> things back in here, um, but it comes over here. And then I have my little bun coffee brewer and my grinder for the coffee that I sell, which um, my beans are all put out whole bean and ground at the customer's request. So some of them want to take it whole bean, which of course is what I encourage them to do. And then if they want it ground, I go ahead and do that right at that time for them. Awesome. Um, and then my cash, cash register behind that. And then you can kind of see out over in here is the shared space that I have with the brewery for customers to dine in. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I love the, I love the red. Uh, I love the, the color coordinated theme that you've got with everything with the roaster and the fridge and the, the espresso machine. Good job. Yeah, really nice. no, that was a lot of fun. And I actually didn't obviously pick the roaster because he already had the roaster at the brewery, but it was such fun in terms of colors that I just decided to, to run with that. Yeah, no, it looks awesome. So, and then on my other side out here, we come around and it goes into the art gallery. So you can kind of see, get an example. I mean, it's a huge space over here. Um, and back here in the very back, that is a stage. Um, and prior to COVID, we had quite a bit of live music on that stage. Oh, um, there's comedy shows that happen on that stage. I don't know if you can see here, there's what looks like art palettes up here on the ceiling. Those are actually tables that we pull down and we insert them in these little holes in the floor. And this whole area becomes a seating area when we convert it into the stage. And oh, then- it goes on over like the gallery keeps going. There's so many talented artists in here. It's amazing. I can spend all day there just drinking, <laughs> yeah. drinking coffee and move right to the brewery. It's perfect. Exactly. And, it's I and I do have, have quite a few people who come in and they set up their laptop and they have their coffee and they get going on things. And then they switch over to having drinks from the brewery <laughs> when they get their work done. <laughs> That's perfect. And yeah. you roast... Uh, I know we've talked about this before, uh, but do you roast most of the time before everything opens up, right? I do. And, you know, that's something that I didn't have a full grasp on when I designed this space. There's a lot of really convenient things about where I am and being in the middle of two other businesses. But the roaster is very loud. Um, so I, I didn't really... I think fully anticipate just how loud it was going to be and how disruptive it would be to the other businesses. So instead of just having to work around my coffee shop hours, I had to work around their hours. And obviously with the art gallery and then the brewery, they have very different hours. So that's a big part of the day that one of the two of them is open and my roasting would be disruptive to the customers in that space. Okay. So 
Um, I come in pretty early, just about every morning, and do my roasting before the coffee shop opens. Um, there is one night right now, just because things are slow, uh, the brewery is closed on Wednesdays. So on Wednesday nights, I can come in and roast when uh, the art gallery closes, which is at five o'clock. So those are my time frames that I do it. And then occasionally we plan um, and I'll make an announcement because my roaster is in this nice little space where everybody can see it. I do a roasting demo uh, where everybody just is aware that for about 20 to 30 minutes, it's gonna be really loud in here, but there's customers and people that are interested and curious and they wanna see. And so I'll do a demo and have the roaster on during business hours for that. I've got it, I've unmuted myself. We've got some, some extracurricular activities going on behind me <laughs> okay. that I hear. So I'll, I'll be muting myself and on, but I'm going to field some questions for you that we've got sure. on YouTube and Facebook. So Donnie, uh, my co-host over at Project Buna, he says, have you had, had the opportunity to collaborate with the brewery for a joint project, coffee and beer? Yes, um, that was really fun to do actually. And at the moment they don't have any coffee beers on, they are limited on what they're have in production because of COVID things that are going on. Um, but they previously, prior to the COVID thing, there were two beers that I collaborated with them on and I found it endlessly fun um, to not just put my coffee into a beer, but to find the right coffee to accent what was going on in that beer. Um, both of them had been brewed with coffee previously. So we had this like standard of what they were doing and they weren't bad beers, but when we, when I made adjustments to accent for certain flavors and chose coffee in that way, it just upped the quality of the beers immensely. So it was a lot of fun to do that project. And I definitely look forward to working on that sort of thing again. Put me down for a sixer <laughs> okay. when, when you do it again. Cause I'm, I, I'm a, that was kind of like my first complicated love of food or of something else was was beer and that is I, I love trying different ones and and tasting you know I, I used to have the whole beer nerd app where you know you, you track yeah. what beer you had and all that stuff so I'm, I'm definitely down for the next time y'all uh collaborate on that what was one of the biggest takeaways that you got from doing that project with the brewery um, you know, I, I'm not sure whether I took away more in terms of knowledge about pairing things or if I, also experimenting in terms of brew time, because that was another thing that was a, quite a project, because I, I think we started putting it in at one point during the brew process and it came out really, really, really strong. So then we had to go back and um, at another point, we actually ended up instead of putting the coffee in ahead of time, we ended up doing a most of the brewing process and then adding cold brew to it, which worked out better in that particular case. Um, so it was fun to experiment and learn about the, how the coffee interacted with the brewing process. But I think mostly it took away that I just really love doing this sort of thing with coffee. I love finding those flavors. I love pairing um, anything. I mean, honestly, I had fun when I worked for the brewery uh, doing their wine stuff. I had fun helping people find the right wine to go with their meal. Um, because it's just a fun side of things that I, I used to do for myself, but I didn't really realize until I got into it how much I enjoyed it. That's awesome. So we got another question here sure. we got from Everything Coffee by Thomas. He says, what make and model of coffee roaster is being used? Sure. It's an Artisan 6M by Coffee Crafters. Awesome. And that's the one that the brewery had prior to you taking over. Correct. Correct. But I do really love it. I have multiple times looked at um expanding because of, of how much coffee goes in and out of here um and getting a larger roaster and to be honest i think i would probably just upgrade to the larger version that coffee crafters has um because i really love working on it uh, i have just gotten to know that machine really well and i feel like i have a good grasp of how to control the roast at the points that are critical for getting the flavors that i want um, and I mean, I feel like everybody can really do that with their machine as long as you get to know your machine mm -hmm. so that you have that, that complete control over it. But the, it, I definitely feel um, 
I don't know, I guess compared to other roasters, I feel like my, my artisan six M is like driving a Porsche compared to, I don't know, driving a truck. Maybe, <laughs> um, I love the amount of control that I have over it. So, uh, I definitely recommend coffee crafters. They as a company have been really great to work with too. When I officially purchased this roaster from the brewery, um, they, you know, were really great to get me up to speed on the maintenance that needed to be done or hadn't been done on it and what I could do to make sure that I could keep it running in top condition. They helped me get it installed in this new location and I hadn't even actually purchased this from them. I purchased it from somebody they bought it from, but they are great people over there and they definitely want to see you succeed. So I, I can't say anything but great stuff about them and about the roaster. That's awesome. That's really, you know, uh, if you've got some strings to pull over there, I would love uh, to interview somebody on the show uh, about about you know what what it goes into building one of those roasters because they're just uh, whether it's a air fluid bed or an air air roaster or or a, a drum roaster I should say you know there's there's a lot of moving parts literally you know, yeah no uh, for sure that that has to work properly for it to put out a good consistent product and that's so important. Um, you mentioned capacity, so yeah. you're roasting about five and a half, six pounds at a time. I roast usually more than three to four pounds at three a time, and I can do three to four of those in an hour. Okay, three to four an hour. And so, what's your coffee capacity currently at the cafe? Like, what are you going through oh, on a busy week? A lot. <laughs> That's um, where I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I go through a lot of coffee. Um, it's, I didn't really know what to expect with COVID this year. I thought that things would be different, but I actually ended up going through probably twice the amount of coffee that I was going through at the previous location. And uh, I think some of that had to do with the fact that the way that Michigan opened back up through COVID, uh, not all counties and areas were fully open and we were. So because we were a rural area and we didn't have a high number of cases. And so people from all over were coming here because of the fact that we were open. Um, but I, I regularly go through at least anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds a day on espresso alone. And then I'm selling the bags of coffee and shipping them out for subscription orders. So um, I'm trying to tally all of that up in my head. I mean, but I probably during our busier months in the summer, I'm going through at least 100 pounds of coffee a week. That's awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. What is your, and this is something I just, I just thought of as we were talking and, and it was that squirrel moment. What is your follow up on that, that customer that comes in, loves your coffee and how do you approach them about buying your coffee online? Do you have an email sign up? Do you, do you have any information capture stuff there? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so I have a rewards program. I use Tap Mango, which is a company I also highly recommend. Um, they are also re what runs my online ordering system. Um, but every time ever people come in, they have an option to sign up. They just put in their phone number. They can scan a tag. And uh, then they, they earn points towards free drinks. And it also gives me the ability to send out specials and keep in touch and uh, give communication to them. But I, I frequently find... Um, people will come through here, and I, th I think I've mentioned to you that a lot of my customers are not necessarily people who live here, but they're traveling to somewhere, and they're going through Grayling to get there. Um, but a lot of times I'll get somebody who stops in, they're just looking for a coffee, they get that coffee. I don't necessarily get their information at that point, but on their way back, they stop again because they're like, oh, I couldn't stop thinking about that cup of coffee. And I'm like, well, I ship it all over the country. <laughs> and here's my, how you can get a hold of me. And I explain the whole website to them and they frequently follow up with that. Um, That's awesome. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's worked out really well for me. And then I, I love Tap Mango reaches out to customers. Uh, you set up, it's entirely up to you how you set that up. But if customers haven't been in a while, it'll send them a text or an email and say, hey, we've missed you. Come on in and we'll give you, you know, a free coffee or a couple dollars off of something. And that's a really great way to stay in touch with your customers as well. And you, you mentioned another thing when, when we were in the green room talking about your pre-order system for your regular clients that you utilize. So when the when your regulars know that you're going to be busy, they can pre-order their coffee. Tell us about that. 
Yeah. So um, at this moment, you can go to my website and there's a button that says order now and it takes them into an order screen and you can order and submit it to be done as soon as possible. Or you can schedule a time that you're going to come and pick it up. And that comes through on a screen that I have set up next to my espresso machine. A little alarm goes off and tells me I have a drink order that's there. And then I have the option to accept or reject that depending on what it is. Um, if I reject it, I can send a text message to the client and let them know why I'm rejecting it. Like maybe you ordered a mocha and I'm out of chocolate right now. <laughs> um, or whatever reason. I, I actually haven't found so far since I've had this system, I haven't had to reject any orders, all of them I've been able to accept, but I like that I have the ability to if I need to. Um, and then they just come in and pick it up. They don't have to stand in line. It's already paid for. Their points for their rewards are already accounted for. Um, they also have the ability to load money onto a wallet into this system. So if they have like a coffee budget and they just want to go ahead and put it all there and then they can pay for their coffee from that, they can do that. Uh, it's just extremely convenient. It's also a way for people who want contactless payments because a lot of people are interested in that right now. They can get online, they can place their order there, and they don't have to touch anything other than their coffee when they come in. So is a local person able to order, uh, you know, an Americano and pick up a bag of coffee at the same yes. time? Does, does it work like that? Yes. That is fantastic. That is really fantastic. So what I'm getting at here... Uh, as, <laughs> as you know, we we've, most of my audience at this point is it's coffee roasters and cafe owners. Is that this is a really awesome way for somebody to take, uh, and you and you kind of kind of stumbled into it to be able to if a coffee roaster is out there and he's needing a space or or she's needing a space, something like this is a is a phenomenal idea to get in to keep your overhead somewhat down yes i i agree with you 100 percent on that chris because it has benefited me in a massive way in fact i know when uh, i was at the other location and the brewery decided they were going to pull out of there um, i actually talked to the owner about taking over that building and when i looked at what the overhead cost was i just felt like it was a little too much for my little coffee shop and so that's the reason i made the decision to come down here and the art gallery had actually approached me when they knew that that building was changing and everything and said hey we'd love to have you come in here and then surprisingly enough i had several other businesses that talked to me about coming into their location as well i think because they saw the benefit of uh sharing our customer bases so mm -hmm. i felt like the art gallery and being next to the brewery i was previously associated with was a, a good call and it has worked out for all of us um and for somebody who isn't already in that sort of thing don't be shy about talking to other businesses about what you have to offer and what you can both benefit from by sharing a space like that. That's something I would highly recommend, um, both for keeping your, your overhead costs down so that you can stay focused on what you're doing, um, but also in terms of just how much you can collaborate with each other to create a larger clientele base than you might get on your own somewhere. It's all about collaboration. I'm a big yeah. fan. I'm a big fan of everybody working together to provide customers, you know, the best coffee that they can possibly get. Yeah. That's really cool that, that space that you're in. What type of lessons have you learned in that co-shared space? Besides that you can't roast. I can't roast. Yeah. Whenever I want to. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Lessons learned. Um, I definitely have to uh, keep myself focused. I have uh, learned from being, you know, at the other location, most of the time our shifts, we were in there on our own and I was able to get a lot of work done. And here, first of all, I rarely have downtime <laughs> like I did at the other location. So there's not as much time to be getting things done during an open shift. But I also have a tendency to talk to more people, which is both good and not so good on my schedule in terms of getting things done during opening hours. Um, so that's a lesson that I had to learn to really schedule and keep myself on track during the day to make sure that I was getting everything done that I needed to so I didn't end up staying, you know, four or five hours past closing so that I could get my work all done, my cleaning all done because I was chatting with so many people in the art gallery or in the brewery. 
Um, but again, that's also good for business because I definitely have had a lot more business come through here. So it's a, like win or lose. I would just say it's a matter of knowing that you have to really manage your time um, to be able to fit into a busy space like that and still get everything that you need to have done. Um, you know, it's especially in the COVID-19 time that we're at and the disconnected that di disconnected avenues of approach that we have and just everything's separate being able to connect with somebody like that in a personal space is you know somebody might be just coming in to buy coffee because they get to engage with you you know i mean 100 percent. just that atmosphere that engagement uh you know i since i'm e-commerce based in, in every, pretty much everything i do it's such a challenge to engage with people and you know sometimes you get people that are just absolutely amazed that you you've reached out and contacted them back through facebook or or through email or stuff like that and being yeah. able to do it face by face to face but six feet apart is, is such an awesome thing to be able to still do uh and we, we've got a comment here everything coffee by thomas says that's a nice roaster Many would say it's too small, but I've done 2,000 pound orders on a six pound roaster. That sounds like a lot of coffee being roasted. It is a lot, but it can be done. <laughs> six um, pounds at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what is your favorite? I, I got in the discussion with Jen last week about uh, Ethiopian Wish Wish. What is your current favorite coffee that you've got? Oh, goodness. That's really hard to choose. Um, to be honest with you, I think I think my favorite favorite right now is the Colombian Steel Magnolias, which is the one that I, I sent to you last. Mm -hmm. um, I love the richness of the flavor in that one. Um, I, I don't think I've had, of all the people that have tried my coffees, I don't think I've had anyone dislike that one yet. Um, and I definitely find myself just, that's the one that goes in the air pot first because that's what I want to have is my coffee in the morning. <laughs> that is um, what what we sent out for the dark roast subscription here a couple weeks ago. Yes. And yes. When I opened the bag that it stopped my wife halfway through the kitchen. She stopped <laughs> her head turned around. Said, what is that? So that's Colombian coffee from Steph. <laughs> I'll have that. Okay. It, yeah. It really, it's pretty really, good. really good. And, and it was one of those coffees that if you looked it up and then if you looked up coffee in the dictionary, there should be a picture. Yeah, that label is really, really good classic coffee. It is. Good and job. then I have a, I have a, a limited edition one that I'm doing right now. That's a Tanzanian pea berry. That one's not even up on my website. It's one that I just have in here in the shop because I was playing around with it. Um, I may bring it in and put it up on the website as a limited run one, but it's definitely, um, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> that one, it's really good if you have that acquired taste. I had always read that Tanzanian coffees have wine notes to them. And I found that interesting. I had never had coffee that had wine flavors in it. So I was just super intrigued. And um, when I saw it available as a green coffee, I was like, I, I got to get my hands on this and see what I can do with it. The first time I took a sip of it, I was expecting coffee flavor with some wine hints in there. And it it was like I was drinking hot wine. <laughs> so that was a little, I was a little taken aback by it. Not that I didn't like those flavors. It just wasn't what I was expecting. And your mind has this like setup of this is what this should taste like. And when it's different, it doesn't quite know how to wrap around it. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of it, uh, of a, well, of a Tanzanian pea berry, uh, cold brew. Yeah. Yeah. With actually, uh, I, I tried it a couple times this summer with a couple slices of lemon in it, like you would a tea and over ice and it is it is spectacular i get, can yeah i can see that works. and i i actually have been brewing it up quite frequently and i've got a, a few customers that specifically ask for it they think it's the best one out there um but i always have something else brewed up along with it just because i know it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea if you like those flavors um then you're going to like it a lot. And I, I did also find too, that that first taste that I had of it, it was at about the 24 hour point because I had roasted it the day before I let it rest for 24 hours. And that was pretty intense. Um, by the time I got a couple days later, I had let it mellow a little bit. I actually really enjoyed that a lot more. <laughs> so what's your setup look like on menu wise? So you typically have one or two options on the brewed coffee and then the, the espresso setup. 
Correct. I have um, all of my espresso drinks that are up there, uh, which is a pretty huge selection of various espresso drinks I can do. And then um, on the weekdays, I usually only have one or two that I've pre-brewed up. Um, on the weekends, it's a much bigger selection of it because I have a lot more people coming through. And then, of course, any time of day, people can do pour overs of any variety of my coffee that they want to do, which a lot of people do choose uh, to do. And I, I love a lot of my pour over people have have figured out how to do the online ordering because they know it takes a minute to get that one ready, but they can hop on and they can order it and then it's ready when they come oh, in. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really nice. And with, with the wide variety of coffees that you have, you have an espresso blend that you, that you do? I actually use the single origin for okay. my espresso, which I know not a lot of people do. Um, I use espresso reserve from doTERRA estate in Brazil. And I didn't feel the need to blend it. There's so much complexity in that bean, the way that I roast it. I love the flavor. I love how it blends with milk. I love how it accents um, my coffee drinks. I get a lot of compliments on it. It also makes a pretty darn good pour over as well. So I couldn't be happier with where that is on it. And it is just the single origin. Now, do you, when, when yours, since you've got the setup, this is why I'm asking, since you've got the setup where you're, you're able to bring in different coffee and roast it, do you, do you try everything that you get in? Do you try it in an espresso? Do yes. You, <laughs> yes. Okay. I do. Yes. I play with that. Um, uh, one of the most interesting espresso ones that I've done that I actually really liked was that I took my Monsoon to Malabar blonde roast and made oh. an espresso out of the blonde roast. Um, that blonde roast was almost a white roast. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's super light. It's, it's super, it's super, it, it was closer to a white roast that I had from another roaster than I had it. I did an espresso with it. Well, I did, and I say espresso, I, it, I, I did it with a, a fellow. Uh, AeroPress attachment, but so I haven't ran it. I didn't run it through my flare or anything, but it was definitely, uh, definitely more to the peanut buttery side yeah. of the coffee. It was very, very good, very, very smooth. But I never had a, had a Malabar that light roasted, and I think it was, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, and you know that coffee is. It's interesting and fun to play with as a roaster because I've actually done several different roasts with that particular green coffee. And some of them I outright didn't like. I don't like it as a medium roast at all. Uh, somehow being at that level brought out a lot of bitterness in it that didn't go with the flavors that I think should be accentuated in that coffee. But it makes that phenomenal blonde roast, which is what I decided to go with because I didn't have anything in that light of a spectrum. Uh, it also makes a phenomenal French roast, uh, which I do have a couple of customers that I specifically roasted that way for. Awesome. So when, when you're local and, 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 a, and a frequent flyer there, you can get your own, get your own custom roast? That's yes, cool. you can. <laughs> awesome. So what's, what's one of the craziest, besides the pea berry, what's the craziest coffee that you've roasted? Craziest coffee? Mmm. I, you know, I'm trying to think. There's been so many that have come in and I, I don't know that I would say they were necessarily crazy so much as just different. Um, I know I had one that I got in from the Congo that had a lot of lemon flavor to it, um, which is nothing wrong with that. It was an extremely bright cup of coffee, but it's not my my normal go-to so i ended up not staying with that one but it was really interesting um to me because it was almost in the like lemonade type flavors okay. um, which was the the strongest that i had had uh, in the citrus area from a, a single origin coffee so that one was a little bit crazy to work with um i did play around with that one and got some decent flavors out of it but ultimately just decided it wasn't what i wanted to have in my repertoire um, how, how often do you explore coffee like this? Uh, fairly often. Um, I keep an eye out. Um, I buy a lot of my green coffees through Theta Ridge Coffee, and so I watch what they have coming in. I also pay attention to doTERRA Estates and their auctions because I, I find it extremely fascinating what they do there with their coffee research. And uh, they have lots that come out that are only available that one time. And then there's the ones that are their standards. And um, 
So I like to watch and see. And anytime something catches my eye for either the flavor profile or because I'm interested in the story behind what's going on with that coffee, I'll bring it in. And that's something that I think is almost as important to me as having a really good flavor. An interesting, unique flavor in the coffee is the story that I can tell my customers all the way from where it was grown uh, and processed to coming to this country, to being roasted by me, to being served in their cup. Um, so there's been quite a few that I've brought in just simply because I found the story interesting. That's how I came across the Steel Magnolias, actually, because they are a collective of women that grow that coffee. And I loved the story behind how those women got together and started this coffee farm. And I, I wanted to see what they had to offer. And then I was obviously extremely pleased with the coffee that came as well. Exactly. Um, I have another one that's from Honduras that is a similar story. It's a, a woman that used to be a pharmacist, and then she got into growing coffee. And uh, I brought that one in and, again, was just outrageously pleased. In fact, she actually has several varieties of coffee, and I'm planning on playing with more of hers because I was so impressed with the red honey. The Finca Debra? Yes, yes. Yeah. I've, I've came across that a couple times on when, I, when I'm, you know, I've got 400 Four hundred something different roasts, I think, at this point, on the website. And every once in a while, I'll come across something and I'll pause. And every time I see it, it always be like, "Chris, you want to try that one? Chris, <laughs> you need to go back and try that one." So I'm, I might have to get on here later and, and order a bag of that just to now that I know there's even a more interesting story than than what I've what yeah. I've read already. Yeah. Just, no, I love the community that coffee is because it really is this connecting thing that runs not just between us and our customers but globally and telling people the story of where it came from and how this cup ended up there is I just think a hugely connecting thing that's important for people to experience it's it's really cool to get on and I'll show you next week after we get some stats from the the, the video all the different countries that either download the, the podcast or watch on YouTube. Uh, last week, we had a whole bunch that were uh, Philippines watching, uh, in South Korea was watching, or at least viewed the podcast on YouTube. And then, you know, I, I've got my, I, I, like, one of the top 50 coffee podcasts in Europe at this point. Apparently, there's not oh, that wow. many. So it's kind of cool to be, you know, number number 15 in Norway when it comes to small business podcasts because I've got a small following over there so it it does connect and it does it connects us all around the globe with something that's you know really really delicious in most yeah instances. it's a common language really <laughs> awesome so tell everybody we're, we're getting close to that hour mark I want you to tell everybody where they can find you at um, so anyone in this country can order coffee from me at coffeebystaff.com. Um, super easy to get on there. You can see everything that I've got at the moment. I've also got a blog that I do, which I have to admit, I have not been as uh, good about entering lately, uh, just because since opening the coffee shop here and being the sole person in here, and I wasn't sure what was going on with COVID, so I didn't want to hire anybody yet. Um, that's taken up a lot more of my time uh, than I used to have so at some point here i'll get back to really entering my blog entries um, and talking about what i'm doing with coffee and why and my theories on roasting and buying green coffee um, for whoever wants to learn that information um, but there's a lot on my website and uh, yeah you can order any of the coffees there i'll ship wherever you can also uh, email me stuff at coffeebystuff.com i have some people that uh, for whatever reason aren't as comfortable navigating the website and you can just let me know what you want and I'll send an invoice over to you and we'll get it out. It does happen. And, and you can find your coffee as well on Roasters Marketplace Yep. and at your cafe. Yes. Yes. Awesome. I really appreciate you coming on the show tonight, taking a few minutes to talk to our audience out there, Steph. I, I really, uh, I can't say enough about how happy I was to connect with you back uh, in the springtime when all of this started and then to finally connect back with you again this summer to finally get your, your products up on the website and to uh, kind of come full circle and get you on the podcast because I, I just loved hearing about the cafe and the space that you were operating in and I think it'll help 
a lot of people that might be a lot of coffee roasters or cafe owners that are in this weird time or a transitional space where you know it's a good idea to find a shared yeah. a shared space that you can roast in and serve coffee yeah absolutely and again don't be shy about it because it's going to benefit the people that you're sharing that space with just as much as it's going to benefit you um i i can't say that enough it, it helps all of us definitely okay don't go anywhere i'm going to drop okay. you down in the green room and i'm going to sign off here all right thank you all right everybody thanks for tuning in listening down the road if you're tuning into the podcast make sure you give us a five-star review over on Apple, or you can give us a one-star. One-star is cool, too, if you're listening. Uh, Go ahead and like, subscribe, follow, share the podcast. We're actually going to be putting the podcast link in the comments to the show first thing in the morning. That way I can catch this YouTube algorithm that keeps on showing my show to everybody on Mondays. But anyway, tune in next week. Special show, Veterans Edition. I'll be sitting down with Donnie and the boys from... uh, Project Buna, we've got Doug coming on from Fuzzy Monkey. Uh, I've got uh, Juan or Jose coming from uh, Third Day Coffee, Seguin. We've got a whole list of veterans that are going to be on the show next week talking about our shared experience as veterans and our current shared experience in the coffee space. So we really appreciate you listening. Tune in next week. Download the podcast. Really appreciate your support. We should break 2,000 downloads in like the next 48 hours, I think. So cross your fingers. Cheers. Have a great night.